Now, Vinay. Quite good, man. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. So don't keep moving it because we have. It's a mask without a mask. It's a mask without a mask. I said. We'll start. Yeah. So can, can I start, Vinay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, yeah. So good evening. Uh, on behalf of ISCC Bangalore chapter, we welcome uh, welcome you all for the fifth in a bicep program. And you know that we had a we had a very overwhelming response in the last you know, four program which has been happening. But due to the unprecedented you know, crisis, what is happening because of the COVID and all, we have been uh, forced to try this out on a webinar mode this time. And you know we have around two hours out there, as you all know, and uh, you know lots of topics are there. Obviously, the cardiovascular system is a, it's an ex exhaustive topic. And you know uh, the thing is that we won't be, as we all know, because of time constraint, we won't be able to uh, when touch in detail in detail about each and every every part of the aspect of this uh, this uh, topic. But you know, we'll be just you know introducing you, especially from the exam point of view. And you know, obviously, we know that you know we'll be we'll be just get, you will be getting primed with that some of the important topic for the exam. And you know that is what we are just looking at this program in this program at least because of the time constraints. And we know that now because of the ongoing crisis, you know, the, the exams are also like some kind of indefinitely suspended. But what we are understanding at this point of time is that the IDCCM exam is going to happen in another four to six weeks. The exam is going to be online, uh, the theory exam followed by some kind of an online practical. Maybe the, the, the IFCCM exam is going to happen in another three, four weeks time. That's what we are understanding. And in a, if DNB exams, you know, there is no confirmation has come now. I don't want to uh, take your time. I uh, I would like to hand over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Sunil Karant, and he's the first speaker. Uh, he'll have a few words with him and he'll be going to the topic of heart-lung interaction.
You can see it from there. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Ajit. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Ajit has mentioned, we will start off uh, with the cardiovascular system. I'll be talking about the heart-lung interactions, which is pretty much basic physiology, which we are all uh, probably familiar with. We just need to uh, recollect from our MBBS days and maybe our basic sciences from our post-graduation days about uh, some basic interactions between heart and lung. Now, this history, uh, the concept of heart-lung interaction is not new to us. It's been uh, well documented for the last 400 odd years. Its first mention was made by William Harvey in his uh, book, uh, followed by uh, the description of this interaction, which was first given by Stephen Hales. Uh, subsequently, uh, the role of RV in or the right ventricle and the right atrium in, uh, in, the, in this heart-lung interaction was further more clearly given by Guyton. So therefore, as you can see, there has been an evolution on this process of understanding of heart-lung interaction from the very basic concept that there are four chambers, there is certain interaction to the point that RARV plays a significant role in this heart-lung interaction. Uh, so what is the reason for these interactions uh, or for these sort of uh, this thing? As we know, RV was always assumed to be a passive uh, uh, to be a passive chamber. Uh, it does have certain protective characteristics, especially like the tolerant. Uh, it is tolerant to diastolic dysfunction. Uh, quite accommodative for rapid changes in the uh, afterload, and therefore uh, can accordingly adjust its uh, systolic function. The other things of uh, uh, note would be uh, respiratory mechanics in the respiratory settings, effect of the LV, septal interaction, and the effect of being in a closed sac. So these are all the reasons for why we need uh, for why we need to understand the heart-lung interaction and uh, the principles of heart-lung interactions are governed by these four or five factors. So it's not only the chambers of the heart, but it's also to do with the interventricular septum. It's to do with the fact that the heart is enclosed in a single large chest cavity uh, within which there is a sac called the pericardial sac inside which you've got the heart. So uh, there are multiple uh, uh, principles involved or the multiple factors which are involved in uh, defining these heart-lung interactions. The basic definition of heart-lung interaction is the fact that uh, it, uh, these are respiratory system alterations which are reflected in the cardiovascular system. So in a spontaneously breathing patient, the simple example of this is the pulses paradox. As you know, the blood pressure dips by less than about 10 millimeters of mercury mean uh, whenever there is a, no, when a breath that is taken. Of course, it gets exaggerated whenever there are certain pathologies in the lung, like the cardiac tamponade, status asthmaticus, et cetera, in a spontaneously breathing patient. In a mechanically ventilated patient, the basic principles of negative pressure becomes positive pressure. And so we do see a phenomena called the reverse pulses paradoxes. And on this, there are other effects of a cyclical change which happens transiently. So essentially, that is what we talk about. Uh, that is, these are the effects that we uh, see whenever there, there are these heart-lung interactions in a positive pressure breathing. The phasic effects of the inspiration uh, causes extra, uh, sorry, end diastolic volume and stroke volume changes, uh, which can be in opposite directions for a positive and negative pressure breathing. And we will discuss a few of those things. Firstly, as I said, there are two aspects to it. One is the steady state effect of any, any positive pressure ventilation, as we would see in somebody who has a constant PEEP or a CPAP. Um, the basic thing which happens is the fact that the preload is returned in any uh, positive pressure uh, ventilation. Uh, so therefore, in a steady state effect where there is a fixed uh, PEEP or a fixed pressure applied, you find that uh, the preload reduction happens and uh, subsequently there are changes which do happen in the afterload as well due to this constant positive pressure. The typical scenario is the institution of positive pressure ventilation in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema where we see that there is a beneficial effect on an uh, afterload uh, uh, dependent heart and the moment you reduce the afterload, you find that there is substantial improvement in the cardiac output itself. So on the two sides of the heart, the right and left, as we know, the positive pressure ventilation from the right side decreases the venous return. And at the same time, there is decreased afterload on the left ventricle, uh, which in turn helps in decreasing the pulmonary edema. 
the effect of the steady state on the right ventricle, as I already said, is decreasing the venous return and tends to increase the RV after load. So it's a sort of a detrimental effect that you see on the positive, on application of a positive pressure. Uh, versus on the LV, you find that there is decrease in the afterload, followed by uh, uh, followed by an excessive increase. Uh, oh, sorry, excessive uh, increase in the pressure, however, can actually be detrimental, causing compromise of the diastolic uh, coronary blood flow and therefore causing coronary ischemia. Uh, so there is a balance between the inflow and the outflow that needs to be looked into whenever we think about applying positive pressure ventilation. Else, uh, as I said, there is uh, acute core pulmonary-like situation which can happen on the right side. And on the left side, there could be uh, uh, implications of worsening coronary ischemia. In a spontaneously breathing patient, uh, the concept of pulses paradoxes uh, is present, as I've already said, which can get exaggerated in certain conditions wherein there are right, uh, wide swings in the intrathoracic pressure, as we would see in status asthmaticus, or uh, which results in a shift of the interventricular septum to the left, and therefore correspondingly causing uh, increase in the mean circulatory filling pressure due to the elevated intra-abdominal pressure. So whenever we talk about um, uh, exaggeration exaggeration of the uh, normal phenomena, the basic thing that happens is that because of the negative pressure ventilation, there is pooling of blood or negative pressure breathing, there is intrathoracic pressure, there is pooling of blood in the pulmonary vasculature, causing, uh, 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 causing therefore a decrease in the venous return coming to the left side of the heart. And this in turn reflects in a decreased cardiac stroke volume, which is which is the conventional uh, characteristic feature that we see in a normal negative pressure breathing. Of course, there are additional factors of dissociation of the pericardial pressure from intrathoracic pressure, which also adds to the exaggeration that does happen in uh, certain situations like the cardiac tamponade. Now, um, uh, the other uh, situation where we do see pulses paradoxes is tension pneumothorax, acute asthma, and such other places where we do see wide swings in the intrathoracic pressure. These phasic uh, heart-lung interactions have uh, implications in, a, in the clinical context as well, such as uh, weaning from a mechanical ventilator, efficiency of CPR, and also, of course, in a positive pressure ventilation, as I will uh, talk as we go ahead to assess what is called as the fluid responsive status. In a mechanically ventilated patient, the concept which I have already mentioned as paradox, pulses paradoxes, which is decrease in the stroke volume and the blood pressure during inspiration is reversed, which means a positive pressure ventilation, ventilated patient, you find that the blood pressure tends to go up or increase, a uh, mean pressure increases during the positive pressure uh, during inspiration as compared to ext expiration. Uh, and uh, this concept has been used in clinical implications uh, for clinical application uh, by what we call as measuring the pulse pressure variation, the systolic pressure variation. Uh, the effect of the mechanical ventilation on the right ventricle is denoted by the what we call as the D-down effect. If you look at the previous slide, uh, you find that uh, the part which is above the baseline is called the D up or the delta up and the part below is called the delta down. So the delta down effect in the positive pressure ventilation happens because of the effect of the positive pressure on the right ventricle, which is characterized by the decreasing uh, venous return, increased afterload due to increased pulmonary pressures, uh, which results in decreased RV stroke volume. A decrease in the RV stroke volume gets reflected uh, over a period of time because of the sequential connection between the RV lung and the left ventricle into the left side. And therefore, you find that there is decrease in the LV stroke volume during expiration. So essentially, it is the delay of the inspiratory decline that we see on the, on the right side of the heart, uh, which, is, uh, which reflects on the left side of the heart during the expiratory phase uh, as the cycle of respiration switches from inspiration to expiration. Coming to the preload effect, as I've already said, the positive intrathoracic pressure causes a reverse pulses paradoxes. And this has been used to be to signify what is called uh, as the marker of hypovolemia. And a lot of validation has gone into the assessment of fluid responsiveness. So this is one clinical implication of the mechanical ventilation positive pressure or the reverse pulses paradoxes. Uh, 
what is the afterload effect? The positive pressure ventilation causes distension of areas in the lung. You do find that uh, the over distension can happen in zones one and two. So essentially what happens is there is increased intrathoracic pressure, which causes an increase in the afterload because of increased pulmonary pressure and the squeezing of the pulmonary capillaries, which exaggerates the pulmonary uh, afterload, uh, the, uh, which increases the afterload in the, on the RV. Uh, these... Uh, afterload uh, changes can actually be exaggerated as well in certain disease states. And uh, that is the reason that we find that uh, uh, any increase in the afterload causes increased uh, right heart failure when somebody who has elevated pulmonary artery hypertension is actually put on a mechanical ventilator. So the D-up effect essentially is what we see as a result of the LV, as the result of the positive pressure on the LV, which is where we see that the LV stroke volume increases uh, partly because of the afterload reduction of the LV and also, as I said, because of the delayed reflection of the decreasing venous return that we see in the inspiration uh, on the right side, which gets uh, reflected. So the decreased venous return on the right side reaches the left side of the heart uh, when the respiration is cycled into expiration. So what we see as a decreasing stroke volume in the during inspiration of positive pressure on the right side reflects as a decrease uh, um, uh, decreased stroke volume on the left side during expiration. Now, during chronic heart-lung conditions, these interactions uh, can be uh, can be seen as well. But there are a lot of other uh, variables which can actually affect the heart-lung interaction in a chronic situation. Like as I already told you, exaggeration of the right heart pressures can happen when you place people on positive pressure ventilation, and they already have an underlying core pulmonary or such other thing. Prolonged elevated pulmonary artery pressures uh, does result in right heart hypertrophy, causing chronic core pulmonary, which can actually decompensate when some Somebody ends up needing positive mechanical ventilation. The RV function, however, in a chronic uh, pulmonary artery setting uh, remains preserved for a very, very long time. And unless there is decompensation of the right heart or there is an acute event which decompensates the right heart, RV function is generally preserved. So in summary, heart-lung interactions is not something new, but we have much clearer knowledge specifically related to the contribution of the right heart on the heart-lung interactions in the recent uh, one or two decades. What we need to understand is there are two types of uh, uh, effects that we see on heart-lung interaction. One is the constant steady state positive pressure effect that is seen because of the application of uh, positive pressure or a constant positive pressure like PEEP or CPAP and the cyclical effects that we see because of the, uh, uh, because of the inspiratory and expiratory positive pressure ventilation that does happen. So essentially in the positive pressure ventilation, what happens is the reverse pulses paradoxes, which we see uh, in a normal negative pressure breathing and hence, we, we see that the stroke volume and the MAP tend to increase during positive pressure ventilation as, uh, during inspiration of the positive pressure as compared to uh, the decline in the blood pressure that we see during normal negative pressure breathing. Thank you. So I'll hand over to my next speaker, Dr. Pooja. Good afternoon, everyone. In continuation with uh, the cardiac uh, uh, bicep education program, so the topic which we are going to discuss is acute heart failure, and uh, uh, the main uh, topics which are going to be dealt will be evaluation of uh, acute heart failure or acute decompensated heart failure and its management in the ICU. Acute heart failure re refers to rapid onset or worsening of symptoms or signs of pre-existing heart failure or new onset heart failure. Generally, they can present either as new onset, that is de novo or first occurrence when they come to us to the emergency or to the ICU, or they can present with acute decompensation of pre-existing heart failures, generally precipitated by various factors which I will discuss subsequently. 
uh, how does this all happen? So the pathophysiology can be explained briefly with this uh, diagram. As we can see, the cardiac dysfunction happens, uh, the cardiac dysfunction is like a dam which is built across the onflowing river. Because of cardiac dysfunction, there is congestion, uh, which is again loaded by various factors like endothelial dysfunction, reticular activating system, inflammation, and rest of the things, which because of decreased forward flow will lead to congestion in various organs like liver, kidneys, uh, lungs, GI. And of course, there will be decreased onward flow, which will lead to features of hypoperfusion. So, uh, most common precipitating factors are ischemias, acute myocardial infarction is which we have to always rule out. Other extrinsic factors like infection, uncontrolled hypertension, rhythm disturbances can also pre precipitate pre-existing heart failures. Uh, these are the various uh, to enumerate acute heart, acute coronary syndromes, tachycardias, infection, various stressful situations like surgery, uh, CVAs, acute mechanical complications of uh, ischemias can all precipitate heart failures. Generally, when we come to a patient or how to approach a patient who comes with heart failure, most of them, almost 95% uh, of them will present with hypertension or normal tension on presentation. Of course, 5 to 8% of them can present with low blood pressure. In such patients, the outcomes are real. Uh, most of the times poor. They tend to have a poor outcomes generally when compared to patients who present with stable blood pressure. Symptoms mainly can fit into two spectrums. One is features of congestion or it could be features of decreased perfusion. Congestion could be because of left-sided uh, heart failure or right-sided heart failure. Patients with left-sided heart failure generally present with orthopneas, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and uh, patients with right-sided heart failures mainly present with hep congestive hepatomegaly, bilateral pedal, pedal edemas, and all that. Symptoms of hyperperfusion are generally uh, present with cold peripheries or end organ perfusion factors like decreased urine output, mental confusion, and so on. So identifying in which spectrum they fit is important. This again summates how the features or end organ uh, uh, functions or features respect to various organs are manifested. If we have to classify heart failure mainly based on clinical presentation, like we already discussed, hypertensive versus hypotensive heart failures, depending on their clinical presentation and examination, wet versus dry or cold versus warm, depending on, again, features of congestion and decreased peripheral perfusion. And also, it can also be classified depending on the presence of precipitating factors. So this is an important slide with which we need to understand. The whole clinical spectrum generally fits into these four categories. A patient who do not have either a congestive symptom or uh, features of decreased perfusion, they generally fit into something as a warm or dry on the extreme left. Patients who have major features of congestion with no features of decreased perfusion fit into the warm and wet category. Patients who have main features of hypoperfusion, which fits into the cold and dry category, and who have both congestive and perfusive symptoms fit into a category of cold and wet. So uh, patients who have congestive symptoms presence with pulmonary edema, respiratory failure, congestive hepatomegalies, and like we discussed, hyperperfusive symptoms mainly in terms of per cold peripheries and decreased end organ functions. Why are we worried about this? Mainly to understand how to approach a patient. So clinical examination is the most important thing which will help us to categorize to which spectrum they uh, belong. Of course, X-ray and ECG are extremely important. Uh, patients with congestive features mainly present with pleural effusions, curly lines, cephalization, increased cardiothoracic ratio on the X-rays. Patients can also have specific ECG findings. They could present with acute coronary syndromes, or we could identify arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation on, presenta on presentation, which probably has precipitated the whole uh, process of acute heart failure. Echocardiography generally is preferred immediately in patients who are hemodynamically unstable. In patients who are generally stable in terms of hemodynamics, at least it has to be done within the first 48 hours. Uh, Echo, as we said, shows features of decreased LV function. Coming to laboratory evaluation, 
Few tests are indicated. Natriuretic peptide is indicated only on presentation to an emergency department or CCU. Uh, it is mainly a screening tool and uh, generally helps us to differentiate between uh, uh, cardiac versus non-cardiac causes of breathlessness. Uh, other laboratory evaluations has to be done uh, in respect to what are the precipitating factors like troponins, blood urea, nitrogen, liver function tests, and so on. To sum it up, mainly uh, on presentation to differentiate the type of uh, breathlessness versus cardiac or non-cardiac, uh, nitriuretic peptide levels are indicated. 12 DCG, X-ray, laboratory assessment, all these uh, are also indicated in terms of identifying the etiology. And echocardiography is generally recommended, at least in the first 48 hours. Now, going on to the management part, whenever we have a patient with suspected acute cardiac failure, first things which we have to rule out is, is there a cardiogenic shock? And it has to be addressed accordingly with pharmacological and mechanical support systems. If there is a respiratory failure, the patient may need a ventilator or a mechanical ventilation. And the next subsequent in the first one to two hours, we have to identify the precipitating causes. A simple uh, mnemonic like a CHAMP, which in includes acute coronary syndromes, hypertensive emergency, arrhythmias, acute mechanical causes, and pulmonary embolism are the most frequent precipitating factors which we have to rule out. If we do not have any specific, specific factors, we have to go on with the specific management of heart failure. So patients who present with acute heart failure uh, the first thing which we see is there a feature of congestion. So if it is there, then the patient is called a wet patient. And then we look for signs of peripheral perfusion. If a patient has good peripheral perfusion and has mainly features of uh, congestion, uh, we generally treat them with vasodilators and diuretics. If the patient do not have features of congestion, which is, of course, a very less frequency of uh, around 5%, and who have, uh, we will generally treat them with either fluid resuscitation if they have a decreased peripheral perfusion uh, or with inotropic support. If the patient is having both features, then a combination of inotropes, vasopressors, diuretics are used. Diuretics are the cornerstone of treatment. Loop diuretics form the main lines. Of course, in case of diuretic resistance, a combination with thiazide or mineralocorticoid antagonists are used. Uh, generally, uh, the limit, uh, the dose should be the smallest amount which produces the maximum effect. Loop diuretics includes frusamide, torsamide, and the other group of diuretics I mentioned in this slide. Generally, uh, in patients who are already on diuretics, the equal amount has to be given as an initial bolus, uh, equal to what they are already taking. If the patient is presence with new onset heart failure or is not on diuretics, at least a bolus of 20 to 40 milligrams of flusamide, which is the most commonly used loop diuretic, diuretic is given. Uh, coming to vasodilators, this is the second most important agent used for symptom relief. It generally has dual benefit in terms of decreasing preload and afterloads. It is, of course, avoided in patients who have a low systolic blood pressure. These are the various vasodilators which we can see. Inotropic agents are mainly used in patients who have features of decreased peripheral perfusion. Dopamine, dobutamine, levosimendan, all are the inotropic agents which can be used. Levosimendan is preferred over dobutamine, especially in patients with beta blockade causing to hyperperfusion. Of course, it cannot be used in patients who have low blood pressure. Vasopressors are used in patients who are refractory to the above and also manifest with significant features of end organ, uh, decreased end organ perfusion. And in such patients, norepinephrine is the preferred uh, vasopressor agent. So these are the various vasopressors and inotropes which we can see. Rigoxin, of course, is indicated in few patients, especially who have arrhythmias. Renal replacement therapy is generally not indicated in patients who have a good uh, renal function and who are diuretic responsive. But of course, it may be considered in patients who have features of acute kidney injury or are resistant to diuretics. So this is to summit the uh, uh, management of pharmacological management in terms of diuretics, vasodilators, inotropic agents. And of course, uh, patients who are already on therapies in terms of ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, it is recommended to continue these medications unless there's a contraindication in terms of hemodynamics. So there are a few patients who also present with cardiogenic shock. 
this is a emergency in such patients whatever uh, the patient has to be treated in an intensive care unit with immediate invasive blood pressure monitoring and also most common cause is uh, acute coronary syndrome which precipitates cardiogenic shock and uh, such patients should be treated in a center which have facilities for angiography so uh, in some patients mechanical devices are also used uh, which uh, come into the picture but generally patients with cardiogenic shock iabp the recommendations have gone down especially after the recent shock trial ventricular assist devices are mainly used for patients with long term uh, cardiac failure and generally are not indicated in patients with acute heart failure uh, they are generally used as a bridge to transplant or bridge to decision or bridge to recovery most of the time which again will be dealt with in the subsequent topics so our main goals of treatment are immediately in the emergency department to improve the hemodynamics restore oxygenation and alleviate symptoms and when a patient gets admitted in an uh, uh, intensive care unit we have to up titrate the maximum pharmacological therapy which we can do and of course optimize medications before we go in for uh, long term treatment aspects so thank you everyone stay safe i think uh, the next topic will be by dr narendra prasad Start. So good afternoon. I welcome everyone for the next topic: NSTEMI management in an ICU. So we know as ACS as a whole, it's a spectrum of clinical condition consisting of STEMI, NSTEMI, and unstable angina. Uh, STEMI is very easy to identify based on the ECG plus clinical features and cardiac biomarkers. The problem comes in differentiating between NSTEMI and unstable angina. actually on presentation clinically it's very difficult to distinguish and you treat both as mm -hmm. same but as you progress with your diagnosis and evaluation it's important to make distinction between these two mm -hmm. most importantly unstable angina doesn't have any increase in cardiac biomarkers so pathophysiology i am sure you are already aware it's classically mismatch between your supply and demand maybe due to coronary obstruction or due to pics flow or there may be a number of non coronary causes like severe anemia hypotension tachycardia etc so as a icu physician uh, in a patient where you are suspecting nstemi acs important to keep all dds in mind including cardiovascular causes as well as most importantly non cardiovascular causes like pneumonia pneumothorax gastrointestinal disorders musculoskeletal disorders like costochondritis and other etiologies like herpes zoster involving the thoracic dermatomes and i am sure that will be easy to uh, make out based on your initial history as well as clinical examination so initial evaluation includes definitely history uh, clinical examination clinical examination may help you in ruling out other dds plus uh, identifying cardi cardiac failure features important to do 12 ed ecg within 10 minutes serial ecgs in a symptomatic high risk patients and cardiac biomarkers and as per the guidelines important to make a risk score to classify the patient as intermediate or high risk this is the summary of recommendations so most are class 1 recommendations like doing an ecg within 10 minutes and repeating an ecg every 15 to 30 minutes in a symptomatic patient measure cardiac troponins in all patients with acs symptoms and repeat troponins at 3 to 6 hours and risk stratify to assess the prognosis so bit detail about cardiac biomarkers uh, most importantly troponin irt most commonly troponin i because of more sensitivity and specificity you do a drop i on presentation as well as repeat between 3 to 6 hours to know the trend so increasing trend is more suggestive of nstemi acs beyond 6 hour 
you want to do it again depends on ecg clinical presentation and based on the risk scoring system drop by other than the diagnosis it does suggest you about the short term and long term prognosis and correlate with the infarct size as well as risk of the death you can repeat on day 3 and day 4 uh, the value will indicate the infarct size the other biomarkers which can be used is bnp which is used as a additional prognostic marker this is just from the aha guidelines just to show you that uh, the class 1 recommendations regarding uh, doing troponin on presentation at 3 to 6 hours and repeating after 6 hours in intermediate and high risk patient uh, even troponins can be is it's a class 1 recommendation to use troponin as a short and long term prognosis the so there are uh, other causes where troponins can be elevated we see in uh, routinely in all our icu patients in non ischemic cardiac causes as well as uh, many non cardiac causes including sepsis which we commonly come across burns respiratory failure cardiotoxicity drugs and other important thing is in any patient with deranged renal function and esrd troponins will be falsely elevated so as a icu physician you make differentiate between all these non cardiac causes as well as true cardiac cause causing troponin rise based on the history clinical examination ecg so risk stratification i will not go into details there are four five important scoring system most importantly timi and grace which are commonly used so based on this you uh, classify the patient as intermediate or high risk so treatment uh, constitutes of anti angenal anti platelets and anti coagulants this is these three are most important after this you go for either invasive strategy or ischemia guided strategy this is a summary of recommendation i will be talking in detail uh, coming to initial oxygen supplementation uh, which usually we used to read the most popular treatment modality as mona which is no longer to uh, no, no longer true you give oxygen supplementation only if the saturation is less than 90% or if the patient is hypoxemic otherwise routine use of oxygen may increase the mortality and have certain side effects anti ischemic and analgesic medication start with sublingual nitrogen 0.3 mg every 5 minutes and you can repeat up to 3 dose if the patient is persist to be have ischemic symptoms heart failure or hypertension you consider iv ntg if the patient has recently have taken pda inhibitor ntg is contraindicated analgesic most commonly used iv morphine 1 to 5 mg it does have anxiolytic plus reduces the preload uh, but other than iv morphine uh, using nsaid is are anal 6 it is usually contraindicated because it does increases the cardiovascular side effects beta blockers oral beta blocker should be initiated within 24 hours uh, in the absence of make sure patient doesn't have any signs of heart failure evidence of low output cardiogenic shock or any heart blocks or any other reactive airway disease in the absence of reactive airway disease even patient has got restrictive airway disease like asthma copd you can use continuation of beta blockers it does reduces the mortality uh, generally metoprolol carvedilol or bisoprolol one of these three you can choose iv beta blockers are potentially harmful particularly in those patient with use at a risk of shock calcium channel blocker only non dihydropyridine ccps like verapamil and deltiazem are preferred uh, make sure before using patient doesn't have any conduction abnormality or lv dysfunction and a ccp sir indicated if there is a ongoing ischemia contraindication to beta blocker or the patient persists to have ischemic symptoms and signs even after use of beta blockers and nitrates so long term ccps and nitrates can be used in patient with coronary artery spans cholesterol management high intensity statin therapy uh, it should be initiated or if the patient is an already on treatment it has to be continued and it's reasonable to do lipid profile within 24 hours there are a lot of data of nowadays questioning the benefit of high statin therapy but still guidelines haven't changed uh, next class of drugs inhibitor of uh, ras system ac inhibitor should be started and continued in patients with low ef hypertension diabetic and who has got a stable C kidney disease uh, if you are starting uh, ras inhibitor first 24 hours you need to be extremely careful as the risk of hypertension and further worsening of renal dysfunction will be there if the patient is ac inhibitor intolerant consider starting angiotensin receptor blockers in patient without significant renal dysfunction or hyperkalemia you can use spironolactone 
coming to most important drugs antiplatelets <coughs> loading dose of anti should be given to all patients ecosporin non enteric coated so because enteric coated there is a problem with absorption so please give non enteric coated aspirin as soon as possible and continue the maintenance dose if the patient aspirin hypersensitive or gi intolerance consider loading with clopidogrel whether patient is an invasive or ischemia guided you need to continue aspirin and another antiplatelets for 12 months either with clopidogrel or ticagrelor if the uh, glycoprotein 3b inhibitor we can use along with the dual antiplatelets in a intermediate or high risk patient based on your scoring system coming to parenteral anticoagulation all patients irrespective of the in treatment strategy should get one of the four anticoagulants either enoxaparin or unprecedented aparin and for enox pondofernax or bevaloridin ischemia so after the initial treatment with antiplatelet and anticoagulant you divide the patient whether you have to treat him based on ischemia guided strategy or early invasive strategy in the early invasive strategy you take the patient for coronary angiograph and based on your finding you consider him for uh, stenting in the ischemia guided patient continue medical therapy and you consider him for invasive therapy only if the medical therapy fails or if there are persist to be dynamic ecg changes or perfusion defect or very high prognostic risk based on timi score and gray score hope these two strategies are clear uh, whatever the strategy or patient uh, the patient should be given anti ischemic and anti thrombotic medical therapy so this is just a summary of the same thing which i have told <clears throat> either you can do early invasive or delayed in invasive based on the individual patient so revascularization either you do pci or cabg based on the complexity of coronary vessel involvement or durability of pci or comorbidities or ability of the patient to take or comply with the dual antiplatelets any patient who is going for percutaneous coronary intervention antiplatelets loading and continue dual antiplatelets for 12 months aspirin to be continued indefinitely do you want to continue dual antiplatelets beyond 12 months it's an individual uh, patient call along with the clinical preferences high risk tmi patient not adequately treated with antiplatelets you need to administer glycoprotein 2b3 inhibitor like terofiban at the time of pci anticoagulant uh, during pci it again depends whether patient has already received prior anticoagulation therapy or who has not received based on that you change the doses uh, as mentioned here only thing which i want to highlight is pondofernax uh, it cannot be used as a, a single anticoagulant if the patient is going for uh, pci you need to consider any other anticoagulant with a anti tua activity generally <coughs> heparin is used so if you are reading unfractionated heparin you change your uh, dose as per the act in case of cabg if you if you decided to take the patient for cabg it should be aspirin should be administered and continued in case of elective cabg discontinue clopidogrel and ticagrelor at least 5 days before the surgery if you are using prosegrel at least 7 days before the surgery if it is an urgent cabg clopidogrel and ticagrelor it should be conti continued at least for a day in case of iv glycoprotein 3b to a inhibitor uh, before cabg uh, eftibutide tirofiban should be continued at least 2 to 4 hours and abcixamab at least 12 hours before the surgery so coming to other important features uh, these are all important for a icu patient where you are dealing with instemi patient because there will their primary etiology may be something else where you want to use either analgesic nsaids so if you are considering any nsaids for a instemi patient in icu follow step care approach preferably use astaminophen non acetylated salicylates or small dose of narcotics if required uh, using of non selective nsaids like naproxen or relative cox2 inhibitor Uh, it's all great to recommendation so because the there will be increased thrombosis in a2 generation which causes uh, increases thrombosis uh, this is again as per aha guidelines so safe to use acetaminophen asa tramadol a small dose of narcotic proton pump inhibitor uh, in icu patient obviously there will be risk of gi bleed Uh, if the patient is on triple anti thrombotic therapy uh, with history of gi bleed ppi should be prescribed without gi bleed it's a reasonable t reasonable to use depending on patient is a class 2 recommendation uh, coming to some more special patient groups in a icu setup 
Or elderly patient, we see most commonly in our practice more than 75 years with ECG changes, whether you have to consider him for uh, general like any other patient, it again depends on even though the goals of therapy remains same, you should consider each patient individually based on the comorbidities, functional status and life expectancy. Uh, and we have to make certain changes based on the creatine clearance, pharmacokinetics and volume of distribution. If the patient has got cardiogenic shock, early revascularization is recommended in IC setup. If a diabetes patient, the treatment strategy does not change and obviously you have to control his sugar well. In patient who has already undergone CABG and NSTEMI, consider early invasive strategy. A CKD patient in ICU developing NSTEMI features, the goal of treatment remains same, but you need to modify doses as per creatinine clearance, uh, adequate hydration before taking up for coronary angiogram, invasive strategy is reasonable uh, in stage two or stage three CKD. Uh, but do keep in mind, all CKD patient, there will be higher risk of strength thrombosis, ischemic events, and bleeding. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, I will hand over to Dr. Justin for the next talk. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Narendra, for, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, today, we're going to have a brief uh, chat about uh, uh, how we go about deciding uh, what to do uh, about the pulmonary embolism and then the factors. I think uh, a lot of you people have been reading a lot about the COVID literature in the recent past. And I think we've realized that uh, there is a lot of discussion about the thrombosis and a lot of uh, DVTs and PEs. So we thought uh, um, we haven't seen enough of COVID luckily in Karnataka, so, and particularly in ICU setup. And we haven't faced this at all, but uh, some people in, in North seem to be facing it. So it's a, a good time to just refresh and I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. So the decision-making in pulmonary embolism, um, I'm sure you all would have seen a flow chart like this uh, generally. And uh, when at the top of it, you'll realize that it says clinically suspected PE. And all these uh, flow charts have been designed or uh, uh, generated based on some uh, information which has been collated from postmortem studies, ER presentations, ICU admissions, ward presentations, and uh, mortality charts. So if you look at the population statistics, it looks like uh, majority of the people don't even make it to the hospital uh, if they have had a, a significant PE. And uh, those uh, who actually present to the hospital, very few actually are sick enough to need to ICU admission. So, and uh, when they looked at a big database like an Australian, New Zealand um, database of all the PEs over a period of nine years, they realized that the PE accounted for a very small proportion of ICU admissions because most of the, ICU, most of the PEs ended up getting admitted to wards or dying before they got to a hospital, ICU. So essentially, we've we realized that half the admissions to ICU come from emergency admissions and majority of them are already triaged and had a diagnosis and get admitted to ICU. But the rest are coming from the ward setting which are the ones that we will be discussing about. Out of these, very few actually have the PE diagnosis and most of them are not. So, and then the, the other thing that we've also realized from the epidemiological study is that, um, is that uh, most of the patients who are admitted to either to ICU or a hospital with the normal blood pressure, very rarely progress to deteriorate and need um, SQ therapies or interventions based on a lot of, obviously these are all retrospective and observational data. Um, and then most of the time we seem to admit patients to ICU based on the diagnosis of PE, but not because of the reason why they're being needing vasopressors or therapies or uh, organ supports. So at the end of the day, 
when we looked at the chart there, it said suspect, how to suspect. Um, so we need to know how to suspect these patients. Um, and so obviously we have to, we have to come up with a with strategy uh, of triaging these patients. And the objective way is developing the scoring systems, like you know, everything has scoring system or triaging system. So there are a lot of these triaging uh, scoring systems that are developed well score, modified or even uh, original Geneva score, PESI score, PREP score. So all these are all based on either the presence or absence of disease from a group of patients or based on their outcomes, whether they're just the function outcomes and mortality. Unfortunately, when these scores are applied to patients who are admitted to ICU, most of these studies are retrospective, but still were not reliable to predict as they were supposed to have done so with the ER patients or uh, low risk ward patients. So is the case with the PESI score and other things. So at the end of the day, probability scores developed outside ICU, all these are all developed outside ICU, are not necessarily good enough to be extrapolated to ones that are in, in the ICU patients. Uh, even, even our um, uh, point of care ultrasound um, suspicion of these patients, uh, um, essentially most of these things are done in emergency are designed to see if they can get away with as less testing as possible. So the goals of care are different. A less sicker patient where you are trying to get away with the D-dimer or a VQ scan or, or a clinical symptomatology triage and whether they can be sent home early or not was the, was the driving forces of evaluation and development of flowchart for all these patients. And which is exactly not the situation with ICU where you are receiving the patients who do not have P as a diagnosis, majority of them are coming from the wards in a much sicker situation. So identification becomes a very important aspect in these cases. And, and it, it is very clear that we are poor at identifying and the difference in the way how the patients present from wards in A&E and the risk test stratification doesn't seem to match the current flow charts. And then the clot burden is not uh, matching even with the risk stratification that has been come up there. So we need a high clinical index of suspicion and we need to know what actually high index of suspicion means. So for this, we have to flip the chart itself to make it that we have to triage the patients in a different way. So to flip the chart by actually seeing what kind of patients that you're receiving in, by actually hemodynamics comes even before the suspicion. So that now we have realized that most of the patients that we receive were from a undiagnosed possible PEs are preferably coming from the wards in your hospital itself rather than a PE uh, from, the, from emergency or otherwise where they would have been evaluated already. And this is a simple flow chart that, uh, that we've developed over a period of uh, few days. Most of the patients, either they are normotensive, if they are coming to your ICU for, uh, for observation or suspicion because of the hypoxemia, you can use standard uh, PESI score or, or a well score or Geneva score to stratify them. But still, at the end of the day, as long as you need an ICU admission for these patients, they're going to get a CTPA. That's the end of it on that side. The minute you are hypotensive or have cardiac arrest, the next thing is your investigation of choice is only ultrasound, cardiac ultrasound in this case. If it is, happens in the setting of a trauma, you're looking at EFAST. Otherwise, any other protocol that has a cardiac, cardiac ultrasound will be the one that, that looks at looking for cardiac um, abnormalities, which is RV strain or failure or, or um, uh, features which are consistent with the PE. And the minute you diagnose, you follow on to the management. So the, the flow chart is very simple for ICU patients. You are hypoxic and normotensive, you do CTPA. You are hypotensive or a cardiac arrest, only ultrasound. There is no confusion. No cardiac markers, no CTPA for hypotensive patients. That's as simple as it gets. So when you, when you are faced with the patients, simple is the better. Because at that moment of time, when a patient is hypotensive arresting, you're not going to wait for... BNP to come after four hours or troponin to come about six hours later. So that leads us to the management and I'll keep it even more simple. To give or not to give. So unless you are seeing a massive PE, no thrombolysis. That's as simple as it gets. And I request you to send in some questions and I'll, I'll keep answering as the time goes by because that is controversial talk. Thank you.
I'll now introduce Dr. Raghavendra, uh, who is going to talk to you guys about type 2 MI and stay safe with your social distancing. Thank you, Dr. Jesse. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Raghavendra. Today, I'll be uh, discussing on diagnosis and management dilemma in type 2 myocardial infarction. So just before we go into the details of uh, type 2 myocardial infarction, let us see the classification of uh, myocardial infarction. So uh, it's classified into uh, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. So type 1, uh, it's based on the etiopathogenesis. The atherothrombotic uh, coronary artery disease usually precipitated by atheromatous rupture or erosion. Type 2 MI, ischemic myocardial injury in the context of mismatch between oxygen supply and demand. Type 3, uh, sudden cardiac arrest with the symptoms suggestive of myocardial ischemia, type 4 and type 5. Uh, it is based on the percutaneous coronary interventions or uh, any of the uh, CABG procedures related. So, uh, coming to type 2 myocardial infarction, uh, it occurs due to myocardial oxygen supply uh, versus uh, demand mismatch without any acute atherothrombotic clot disruption. So, it is a heterogeneous entity usually caused by non-coronary trigger. Consensus is always needed about uh, arriving at the diagnosis. So let us see what are the causes of uh, type 2 uh, MI. So it is either uh, reduction in the uh, oxygen supply or uh, supply demand mismatch. So coronary causes are a coronary spasm, coronary embolism, coronary endothelial dysfunction, spontaneous coronary artery disease. Uh, supply demand mismatch are tachyarrhythmias and severe hypertension, uh, which will lead to increased demand. Whereas bradyarrhythmias, severe hypoxia, anemia, and severe hypertension will lead to reduced supply. So now the pathogenesis, the main coronary, uh, non-coronary mechanisms leading to supply demand mismatch and uh, uh, complications are, uh, the initial stimuli will lead to decrease in the oxygen supply, uh, which will again lead to de decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity and which will probably either uh, severe anemia or uh, acute respiratory failure with severe hypoxia will lead to Decrease in the preload, decrease in the cardiac output, uh, which will in turn lead to sympathetic response, uh, leading to increase in the heart rate, systemic vascular resistance, and increase in the cardiac output. So similarly, it will happen with the hypotension and bad arrhythmias. When there is an increase in the oxygen demand, uh, either in uh, as related to tachyarrhythmias or hypertension will again lead to decrease in the stroke volume, diastolic perfusion time, and decrease in the coronary blood flow. So you need to remember that most cases of type 2 myocardial infarction, uh, type 2 MI are uh, triggered by non-coronary etiologies. So uh, this is the clinical spectrum of myocardial injury. So you need to differentiate uh, between a myocardial injury and myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is nothing but myocardial injury when there is a clinical evidence of ischemia. So now coming to the clinical spectrum of myocardial infarction. So uh, it is a classical uh, symptoms of myocardial infarction such as pain, dyspnea, fatigue, or palpitations with classical ECG changes and with a raise in cardiac troponin as in evidence, uh, uh, amazing evidence of new loss of viable myocardium or new regional wall motion abnormality in a pattern consistent with an ischemic etiology. ECG changes, again, uh, STEMI or NSTEMI, but more commonly in a type 2 MI, we see NSME changes and new onset LBB or pathological Q waves. Criteria for myocardial injury uh, as in uh, elevated cardiac troponin values with at least one value above 99th percentile of the upper reference uh, uh, limit. So what do you mean by 99th percentile? Uh, for a given set of population, 99% of the population, uh, the value lies less than the normal limit of cardiac troponin. So these are the ECG changes. Uh, classically, you see ST elevation in STEMI or NSTEMI ST depression and T wave changes. 
So in new uh, ST elevation at J point in two contiguous leads greater than one millimeters in all leads other than leads V2, V3, where the following cutoff points are applied, greater than two millimeters in men greater than 40 and greater, greater than 2.5 in less than 40 years. So ST depression and T wave changes, new horizontal or down sloping of ST depression greater than 0.5 millimeters in two contiguous leads uh, with or uh, with T inversion. So uh, when you come to the differential diagnosis, again, uh, the, there are various causes lead to myocardial injury. It could be a cardiac condition or could be secondary to uh, any other systemic conditions like sepsis, chronic kidney disease, stroke, or subarachnoid. Cardiac conditions like heart failure, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, takotsubu should be kept in mind. So uh, now briefly about cardiac troponins. Uh, uh, these are the normal values of uh, cardiac troponin. High sensitivity cardi cardiac troponin assays are recommended for routine clinical use. There should be a 20% change in cardiac troponin level from the baseline to differentiate between a stable versus a dynamic uh, uh, cardiac troponin pattern. So these are the various studies uh, which have shown that peak cardiac troponin uh, concentrations uh, when compared to type 1 and type 2 uh, myocardial uh, infarction. Uh, it is seen that peak cardiac troponin level are high in uh, type 1 myocardial infarction. So whenever there is a, a, a raise in uh, cardiac troponin levels uh, to a significant level, you need to consider type 1 MI rather than type 2. So older age, female sex, shock, heart failure and coronary artery disease, these are the predictors of poor survival in type 2 myocardial infarction. So imaging is uh, always play, plays a role in diagnosis of uh, type 2 MI. So coronary angiogram is uh, the gold standard. Uh, advanced invasive coronary imaging techniques such as intravascular ultrasound and optical coherence uh, topography have also been used to define block disruption and intracoronary thrombus. So they have moderate sensitivity and an excellent specificity for identification of clock di uh, disruption. So non-invasive non imaging, echocardiography, CT, myocardial perfusion scan or cardiac MRI. If a diagnostic uncertainty prevails, cardiac imaging should be uh, used more oftenly to uh, come at the arrive at the diagnosis of acute MI. It may also help in assessing the other potential etiologies of myocardial injury. So I'm not going to into details of this. Uh, we always know that this echocardiography, again, uh, it is uh, used in assessment of cardiac structure and function, widely available and relatively inexpensive. So uh, CT, again, best uh, suited to assess the anatomy. So diagnostic dilemma in patients with an ICS and uh, coronary artery disease, particularly in a low to intermediate risk patients with a normal ca cardiac troponin and presentation. So uh, CT will help in uh, arriving at the diagnosis. But a diagnosis of MI cannot be established based on a uh, CT uh, coronary angiogram uh, scan alone. So myocardial perfusion scan, again, uh, you can use either uh, echocardiography or CT or MRI for the same, and then uh, which will give us more, uh, uh, it, it'll help in identifying the patterns of myocardial perfusion abnormalities that allow the insights into the mechanism of insult. So cardiac MRI, again, used to assess myocardial dysfunction. It will help in differentiate between ac acute and chronic myocardial injury via the presence of tissue edema. So cardiomyopathies, acu acute myocarditis are well characterized by MRI. But MRI is not well suited to assess the coronary arterial anatomy. So uh, looking at the all-cause mortality uh, in a cohort studies comparing type 1 and type 2 myocardial uh, infarction and myocardial injury, uh, you can see this, the blue line. The, so... Uh, it is always understood that uh, uh, the mortality is very high with type 2 myocardial infarction. So this is another study which is recently published in circulation, which again uh, followed up for eight years, shows high mortality in type 2 MI. So uh, these are the various studies. Again, uh, sorry, uh, you can clearly see that the blue line. So the mortality across uh, type 2 MI is very high when you compare with a type 1. So now coming to the management approach. Uh, so the first uh, imperative thing is uh, obtain a, a good history and then get a ECG, a 12 lead ECG and then cardiac troponin. So when on the initial assessment, if there is a high probability of ischemia and acute myocardial injury and increase in the cardiac troponin elevation, uh, and if there is any evidence of uh, ST elevation, then uh, uh, you can go ahead with the coronary imaging as indicated. If the cul culprit coronary lesion is identified, treat it as MI uh, with a PCI. So 
if there is no uh, coronary angiogram is normal, then and find out if there is any compelling evidence of supply demand mismatch. Yes, then it is indicative of type two MI. So this is the paradigm for uh, evaluation and management. So if the pretested probability of type one MI is low, and if there is evidence of anemia or any other comorbidities uh, as suggested like renal dysfunction, anticoagulant therapy, so then the risk probability of having a MI is low and can be managed conservatively. As in, if the pretest probability of type one MI is very high, likely with the ischemic symptoms with no clear trigger for type two MI, and there is a history of coronary artery disease with ST elevation and very high troponin levels. Uh, and if there is no other uh, precipitating factor, then we will have to go ahead with the invasive coronary angio and PCI therapy with a dual antiplatelet therapy and parenteral anticoagulation. So this is again a, a comparison between uh, uh, your troponin levels and the clinical evidence of acute MI. So, uh, sorry. So on the x-axis, we have the troponin levels and on the y-axis, we have ischemia. So when uh, the magnitude of troponin increase is very low and uh, when there are no signs of ischemia, then there is a low risk. If there is an increase in the uh, ischemia, uh, clinical evidence of acute MI and ischemia with normal troponin levels, then probably unstable angina. If there is increase in the evidence of troponin without any uh, ischemia, then it fits into criteria of myocardial injury or we'll have to see if it is sepsis or critical uh, illness or CKD. When there is a high uh, uh, clinical evidence of myocardial ischemia with uh, uh, raised troponin levels, then it is indicative of type 2 or type 1 myocardial infarction. So this is in a nutshell, the treatment management of uh, uh, type 1 and type 2 MI. So again, it is the same. Uh, it is similar to what we are, I have discussed already. So uh, other treatment options, uh, you can consider using AC inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, beta blockers in a selective patients where there is no LV dysfunction. If there is a coexisting coronary artery disease, then you will have to use an, uh, statins and uh, uh, single antiplatelet in a low dose can be used. But the treatment dilemma comes with a, uh, the role of revascularization remain uncertain. So that's what the dilemma is and you need more studies uh, so the future directions, need for epidemiological studies, novel diagnostic approaches like biomarkers for thrombus formation can be considered, and new therapeutic approaches, the appropriateness of coronary investigation in myocardial injury and type 2 MI, ACT2 trials are awaited, which may warrant different therapeutic approaches. So not but uh, last uh, but the least, uh, as we come across the sepsis and uh, many of the post-operative patients, so they can present with either type 1, type 2 or myocardial injury as precipitated by inflammation or septic shock, uh, which may either precipitate type 1 MI, type 2 MI or just may lead to non-ischemic myocardial injury. So thank you. Thank you one and all for listening. So any questions, I'll take it up later. So now I call upon uh, Dr. Gopal for... Uh, his next topic. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Raghavendra, for the kind introduction. So uh, my topic for the day is uh, acute RV dysfunction in pulmonary embolism and ARDS uh, management uh, strategies. Doctor, your screen is not shared. Okay. Yeah, you can see me? Not yet, sir. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So the topic for my day is uh, acute RV dysfunction in pulmonary embolism and ARDS, the management strategies. Uh, so today, the May 29th is the World Heart Foundation Day. 
so it's a good day to discuss about uh, the cardiovascular effects and uh, the covid times so pulmonary embolism and ards are quite common as a complication in patients with covid so managing uh, these patients are quite important so the contents of my talk will include a uh, introduction etiology pathogenesis clinical features investigations uh, treatment and conclusion so right ventricle is embryonically structurally geometrically and mechanically distinct from the left ventricle it appears triangular in the cross section and it has a thin free wall the muscle fibers have two layers the superficial layer which is circumferential and the deep layers which is longitudinal which contract which we measure what we call as the tap c so this is the cut section of the heart which shows a relatively thin right ventricle compared to a thick left ventricle so it's not dependent or it is not a uh, pressure dependent uh, ventricle so these are the various causes for right ventricle depending on decreasing rv contractility increasing rv volume overload and increased rv pressure overload so we are going to discuss more about pulmonary embolism and ards which are going to cause pressure overload to the right ventricle so as we see in this graph as the pulmonary vascular resistance keeps increasing the pa pressures also keep increasing and at one particular point of time the cardiac output starts dropping down due to what we call as the ventricular interdependence so these are the, some of the clinical features of right sided heart failure so uh, easy fatigability increased peripheral venous pressure ascites enlarged liver and spleen distended or raised jvp weight gain and dependent edema of course these are some chronic signs acute will lead to breathlessness syncope and chest discomfort so various ecg changes happen in a patient with rv strain sinus tachycardia t wave inversions in lab 3 and avf incomplete or complete right bundle branch block qrs more than 90 degrees concurrent deep s waves s1 q3 t3 what we say qr pattern in lead b1 s waves in lead 1 and avl and q waves in 3 and abf the echocardiographic findings in a patient with rv dysfunction includes rv enlargement systolic dysfunction tri tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary hypertension a lot of congenital heart defects can be made out by echo valvular heart disease can be diagnosed and left heart disease concurrent left heart disease can be made out so this is the diagram which shows the echocardiographic changes in a patient with rv failure especially what we look at the ivc the ivc non collapsibility is a good sign in a echo in a bedside echocardiography the tr jet velocity more than 2.8 indicates that it is significant leading to pulmonary hypertension a patient with tapsy less than 1.7 cm is suggestive of uh, rv dysfunction the ratio between the right ventricular and the left ventricular end diastolic diameter more than 1 is a good indicator the other uh, signs are the rv fractional change this is a important sign which is coming up in recent evidence the change less than 35% is suggestive of rv dysfunction the ventricular interdependent septal shift which usually what we call as uh, the ventricular interdependence so the ventricle usually is on the rv it shifts towards the lv suggestive of uh, rv strain the systolic s prime velocity less than 9.5 cm per second the longitudinal strain of the rv free wall less than 20% the right ventricular index of myocardial performance more than 0.54 and at last what we see is the 3d rv ejection fraction less than 45% all these are signs of rv failure so this is the tap c we put a m mode and we look at the lateral wall of the tricuspid annulus so we look for the excursion of the tricuspid annulus and if it's less than 1.7 cm is suggestive of rv failure the other one is the tissue doppler at the uh, tricuspid valve which looks at the s prime and this is the tr jet which we see with uh, uh, to calculate the pa pressures 
and this is the ibc diameter which is measured just distal to the opening of the hepatic vein so these are the numbers which we can see later and these are some of the studies which have shown that echocardiography is as sensitive as an mri to pick up rv failure so this is the other uh, paper which shows that fractional area change of rv is much better than tapsy in diagnosing or picking up rv systolic failure pa catheter rarely used these days but when used it can be used to help us determine the pulmonary vascular resistance the pulmonary pressures cardiac output shunt fraction and pulmonary vasoreactivity so this is the ct which is showing uh, rv filling defect MRI is a gold standard for evaluating right heart structure and function. It is useful in patients with complex congenital heart disease. Precise quantification of valvular regurgitation can be done. It can also be used in planning complex surgeries and for research purposes. So treatment includes six steps. Assess the severity, identify the triggering factors, optimize fluid status, maintain arterial pressure, consider inotropes and take measures to reduce the afterload we'll discuss this in detail so this is a graph which shows that as the pulmonary vascular resistance and the time we see that at frc there is optimum pulmonary vascular resistance this is quite important in the pathophysiology of ards wherein certain alveoli are over distended and certain are collapsed so at frc we have the optimum pulmonary vascular resistance and right ventricular function various uh, vasopressors can be used in patients with vas uh, with uh, rv failure norepinephrine is considered the first line and it is uh, uh, at uh, considerable at the therapeutic doses it decreases the pvr and increases the svr phenylephrine increases svr and pvr and vasopressin will help in uh, will also improve pulmonary vasodilatation so uh, the other inotropes are uh, the dobutamine and the mildrinone so we'll be discussing that later so we see that levosimandan is uh, useful in patients with heart failure and it has shown to be of benefit in patients with acute heart failure so in this study they have shown that levosimandan is more beneficial compared to dobutamine in patients with biventricular failure inhalational uh, prostacyclines help in vasodilatation again the benefit of these agents in ERDS is not proven inhalational nitric oxide again has shown that a meta analysis has shown that it is has no beneficial effect or mortality benefit in patients with ERDS so basically uh, diuretics and vasodilators are class 1 recommendations for heart failure so uh, we'll come to specifically to acute pulmonary embolism which affects uh, in one in every 1000 individuals there are various risk factors clinical features can be from asymptomatic to massive pe resulting in death so uh, the hemodynamic responses depends on the size of the embolus degree of the obstruction physiological reaction and cardiopulmonary status so patients who do not have any pre existing cardiopulmonary disease 25 to 30% of this uh, will have to be occluded for the pulmonary pressures to begin to rise but uh, rv rv can normally uh, increase the pa pressures up to 40 and up to 40, 50 to 75% of the pulmonary vascularity have to be obstructed for the clot uh, before rv failure starts to happen hypoxia again is uh, going to increase vasoconstriction and cause increase the pulmonary vascular resistance and any pre existing coronary or cardiopulmonary comorbidities will worsen diagnosis depends on uh, clinical and investigations as we have discussed the various ecg changes in rv uh, uh, in the rv strain the s1 qt 3 t pattern which is commonly uh, which is classical of pulmonary embolism is not very common but it if it is present it is quite significant precordial t wave inversions 
help in the severe, knowing the severity of the pulmonary embolism and presence of RV dysfunction. Normalization of T wave abnormality implies a favorable outcome. Various laboratory parameters are there. Proponents have a significant prognostic tool as well as BNP. Echo, as we have discussed, there are various factors. So uh, there is uh, the ratio of RV to the LV diastolic diameter more than one or RV end diastolic diameter more than 30 with the loss of inspiratory collapse of IVC. The typical sign, what we call as a mechanical sign in RV, uh, in pulmonary embolism, wherein there is pairing of the RV apex with hypokinesia of the RV free wall, and it is having good sensitivity and specificity to diagnose pulmonary embolism. PF pressures are calculated using uh, RV systolic pressure plus the estimated right atrial pressure. RV systolic pressure is obtained from tricuspid uh, regurgitant jet and the right atrial pressure is based on the IVC. One centimeter is equal to 10 centimeters of uh, right atrial pressure. Transesophageal echo is having good sensitivity and specificity. It can be used in patients who cannot be shifted for radiological imaging. Management includes thrombolysis in any patient who is unstable with pulmonary embolism or in patient with RV dysfunction. Patients who have contraindications to thrombolytic therapy or who do not respond to maximum medical therapy will need percutaneous or surgical embolectomy. Surgical percutaneous therapies will, uh, there are of various types like clot aspiration, clot fragmentation, rheolytic thrombectomy. While surgical embolectomy is not widely available, it can be used to extract large clots. Chronic CTPH will need thromboendotrectomy, vasodilator therapy, or lung transplantation. So prognosis depends on presence of shock. RV dysfunction is going to have a significant effect on mortality in patients with pulmonary embolism. And RV failure, even if it's not present at the beginning, it has to be kept a close watch because they can develop over the next 12 to 48 hours. Coming to patients with ARDS, this is again the definition and uh, we will look at what are the parameters which help in predicting RV failure in patients with ARDS. One is LRTI as a cause of ARDS, PF ratios less than 150, PACO2 more than 48, and driving pressures more than 18. If two of these factors are present, we have to actively look for RV dysfunction in these patients. So it is shown that if two, three, or four of these factors are present, 19%, 34%, and 74% of these patients will have RV dysfunction respectively. So pulmonary vascular tone can be made out by PV, uh, PA catheter, and ventricular interdependence and pulmonary hypertension may cause RV diastolic dysfunction. So there are various uh, factors which leads to raised PA pressures in these patients, starting from hypercapnic acidemia, positive pressure ventilation, and transpulmonary pressures. High PEEP will lead to significant reduction in RV stroke index, high plateau pressures more than 27, and uh, those have a high mortality rate up to 42% in patients with ARDS. And driving pressures more than 18 is also a predictive factor of RV dysfunction in these patients. These patients also have sepsis along with ARDS, so that also contributes to the pulmonary vascular resistance. So how do we diagnose? Uh, pulse pressure variation is a good uh, monitoring uh, factor for uh, patients with RV failure and rapid increase in CVP. If there is a PA catheter, the CVP will be more than the PA occlusion pressures, cardiac index will be low, and uh, mixed, venous, uh, uh, mixed venous oxygenation will be less than 55%. So echo, there are various uh, markers, as we have said. CT and MRI is not beneficial in these patients, and tropa is shown to have prognostic significance. So the treatment includes preload optimization, increasing contactility, and reducing the afterload, and extravascular therapies. Preload optimization includes mini fluid bolus challenge if the patient is hypovolemic, if the patient is on the steep portion of the frank starling curve. If the patient is having elevated filling pressures, diuresis is the used. If the patient is having renal dysfunction, CRRT is required. Measures to improve RV contractility based on 
the most important thing is uh, maintaining the sinus rhythm avoiding arrhythmias and Im improving the av dyssynchrony or avoiding av dyssynchrony norepinephrine is the first vasopressor of choice dobutamine dobutamine and mildenone can also be used but mildenone is better to improve the uh, improve in these patients so to decrease rv afterload uh, we have to use pulmonary vasodilators reversing uh, precipitating factors and rv protective mechanical ventilation strategies so pulmonary vasodilators have no mortality benefit they may worsen oxygenation by increasing shunt fraction rv protective ventilation strategies is by minimizing lung stress by uh, limiting the plateau pressures less than 27 preventing or reversing pulmonary vasoconstriction by improving oxygenation and strict carbon dioxide control and prone positioning extra corporeal therapies include vv ecmo va ecmo and extra corporeal carbon dioxide remover so the, uh, finally the take home points rv dysfunction and failure associated with adverse outcomes in patients with ards echocardiographic markers like tap c will lead to will help us to guide therapeutic interventions rv protective ventilatory strategies are the key in management of these patients with ards acute rv failure in p has a high morbidity and mortality so we have to identify the precipitating factors and restore oxygenation and employ pharmacological therapies or procedures which will help in improving outcome thank you i now welcome dr mahesh for the next talk thank you gopal coming to next talk so we see you call from obg it's quite uh, stressful 36 year old prime uh, 33 weeks of twin gestation admitted 24 hours back with pedal edema fatigability headache was being treated like preeclampsia and uh, she had delivered an hour back when we enter there we see that blood pressure is high she is tachycardic gasping for breath being initiated on oxygen i see oxytocin going blood is going blood products are going lot of differential diagnosis come into mind preeclampsia whether it's a complication of pregnancy associated conditions less likely but embolism uh, whether it's a cardiomyopathy or a coronary event or a undiagnosed previous uh, heart disease or is it all trally taco which is ongoing or a high output failure don't want to mention covid now so abg uh metabolic acidosis with high lactates some thrombocytopenia with low hemoglobin deranged renal function transaminitis deranged coagulation ecg was being done uh, shows uh, some left axis deviation with poor r wave progression uh, echo which subsequently shows a dilated uh, chambers with uh, uh, severe mr and mild pericardial effusion i see cardiology resident come coming and writing uh, troponin bnp prolactin levels and uh, subsequently may require mri angio some discussion was going on it's worthwhile discussing peripartum cardiomyopathy which can come with the uh, combination of presentation like this not a classical presentation though uh, what is the definition heart failure which uh, happens in uh, last month of pregnancy or up to 5 months postpartum with left ventricular systolic dysfunction which is being defined by left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45% or fractional shortening uh, less than 30 or left ventricular end diastolic dimension subsequent definition which uh, showed uh, which um, uh, gave only importance to more of left ventricular systolic dysfunction that is less than 45% but there should not be any other causes of heart failure that is important you need to know about the risk factors uh, one of the important one is extremes of uh, age especially more than 30 and more than 35 is still higher risk so some uh, uh, 
numbers are more uh, in black population uh, india comes in between and what are the differential diagnoses uh, which you need to keep in mind when somebody comes with uh, uh, classical uh, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy that is mimicking dilated cardiomyopathy with acute decompensated heart failure there are various causes which you need to keep in mind so pathophysiology a uh, lot of uh, theories uh, whether it is autoimmune mediated myocarditis or whether it is mitochondrial related or is it all related to prolonged tocolysis but one of the most entertained theory is uh, prolactin based theory where the oxidative stress leading to 16 kiloductan um, prolactin which is a pro apoptotic and anti angiogenic so which can lead to cardiomyocyte uh, myocyte death and another theory which is uh, soluble fms like tyrosine kinase receptor which uh, affects vascular endothelial growth factor and leading to endothelial dysfunction and hypertension the same theory which is behind uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia so how do you evaluate initially assess whether patient is in cardiopulmonary distress uh, that is the important step and if they are in distress you have to optimize preload optimize oxygenation add inotropes or vasopressors when necessary consider urgent delivery and bromocriptin i'll speak about it later and the need for mechanical circulatory support needs to be assessed in recovery phase either they go for weaning or for transplantation and whoever is not in distress if they are in postpartum phase uh, they will go through uh, routine heart failure therapy just like any acute decompensated heart failure but if it is antepartum some of the medications need to be modified so these are the various uh, support which might be needed for your patient whenever they come with peripartum cardiomyopathy at various levels so how do we manage in exam to buy some time we have to always tell preload afterload and cardiac output optimization and uh, you can still buy some more time by telling about abc which you should not forget whether we use niv in a peripartum cardiomyopathy it may be uh, sometimes difficult when you are dealing with a term gestation so whenever in doubt though we know that airway may be uh, difficult in pregnancy consider intubation without any hesitation so who will win the race noradrenaline uh, as per uh, any other acute decompensated uh, heart failure uh, guidelines noradrenaline is the preferred agent but leo simendon uh, has been a competitor as per european guidelines it is the second uh, uh, agent which has to be used over dobutamine or adrenaline and uh, the treatment options uh, that is salt restriction diuresis especially if you are using in a, a pregnant uh, lady you need to be careful and avoid hypotension so that uh, you keep in mind about uterine perfusion and uh, beta 1 selective blockers if you are using uh, that is preferable beta 2 uh, if you are using that can lead to uterine stimulation and hydralazine and nitrates may help as vasodilating agents and in postpartum management may not differ much you can use ac inhibitors or even evabradin which is not studied in pregnancy per se and um, other agents like angiotensin receptor or nephrilizin inhibitors like sacubitril valsartan can be used so anticoagulation gets prime importance in all guidelines especially when ejection fraction is less than 35% and if you are using bromocriptin and it is recommended at least for 8 weeks so if patient is stable with medical therapy can continue pregnancy with close monitoring and in an Uh, in other scenario like when patient is unstable you need to consider cesarean delivery at the earliest bromocriptin is one of the agent which has been uh, uh, in use uh, important is to know that um, counseling the uh, family before you uh, use bromocriptin because it it will suppress lactation and uh, in guidelines european guidelines are recommend it as class 2b but us Uh, tell cities investigation so bromocriptin uh, studies are mainly from uh, germany and europe based studies um, randomized control trials where you don't have a uh, 
control arm or placebo arm because it cannot be uh, permitted. So they used uh, one week and eight week uh, by using so-called bold regimen. Uh, Bromocryptin 2.5 mg once daily for seven days. This is what we uh, routinely see in our practice. Most of the uh, OBG or uh, cardiologist are recommending the same. Or uh, versus one week versus eight week uh, therapy. And uh, among these, uh, LV ejection fraction was the one which was uh, assessed as a primary endpoint. And uh, both the groups showed a similar improvement of LV function over a period of six months. Secondary endpoints of requiring LVAD or heart transplant compared to prior IPAC study, uh, there was no requirement. So they told it as uh, beneficial and they recommended in the subsequent guidelines. Plasma pheresis, IV immunoglobulin, uh, uh, they have no proven benefit. And if medications are optimized, still patient is not responding, then uh, uh, the next step is to use IABP. Uh, IABP along with vasopressors, even if it is not uh, possible to sustain, next option would be ECMO. So other uh, cardio volter defibrillators, whether wearable or implantable, they will be required on a long-term care of the patient and uh, consider cardiac transplantation. Before that, ELSO registry uh, showed um, ECMO, uh, showed 72% of patients uh, were able to uh, get weaned of ECMO and uh, some of them uh, were even uh, taken off ECMO by using uh, assist devices. And 64% uh, uh, survived hospital discharge. So resynchronization therapy uh, that is recommended when uh, there is persistent severe LV dysfunction more than six months, uh, despite of optical optimal medical therapy. So early cardiac transplantation, when I say early, uh, it is uh, uh, not usually considered uh, before six months, uh, but if there is a refractory severe heart failure, uh, when the mechanical circulatory support is not possible or biventricular failure or initially itself there is a right ventricular dysfunction, then early cardiac transplantation before six months still can be considered. So prognosis, important for the family to know. Uh, more than 50% can recover their LV function in first six months. Important uh, factor which decides uh, the recovery is uh, initial presenting EF. Lesser the EF, recovery... Uh, may be prolonged or may not happen. Initially, if they present with hypertension, the chances of recovery is better. And the chances of going into chronic cardiomyopathy is also high if the initial presenting ejection fraction is lesser. That is usually less than 30 to 35%. And the need for mechanical support or cardiac transplantation is among 7% of patients. Complications thromboembolism, arrhythmia management, and uh, possibility of cardiogenic shock. So these are the references. And these are the questions you can expect in your exams. So take home message, keep calm and keep ABC on. I call upon Dr. Sriram to present the next topic. Good evening, everyone. I'll be continuing the session with a brief, brief uh, account on cardiorenal syndrome type 1. Uh, in this session, let us focus on uh, definition and classification of uh, cardiorenal syndrome, pathophysiology, diagnosis and treatment modalities, and overall prognosis. Uh, maintenance of fluid balance, which is very crucial for maintenance of normal hemostasis, is a result of an intricate equilibrium between the heart and kidney. Approximately 30 to 60% of patients with heart failure have moderate to severe kidney impairment, defined as GFR less than, less than 60 ml per minute, which is associated with increased mortality in this subgroup, approximately 50% when compared to 24% who do not have kidney impairment, baseline kidney impairment at the end of one year. 
Now this this tells us that there is a complex cardiorenal crosstalk, which is the basis of what we call is a cardiorenal syndrome. Now uh, let's let's be aware of the definitions. National Heart Lung Blood Institute um, in um, Cardiorenal Interactions Working Group 2004 they defined CRS as a condition where therapy to relieve congestive symptoms like diuresis of heart failure are limited by further decline in renal function. But as we can see here, this definition squarely blames the kidney for uh, the cardiovascular syndrome. So it is skewed and it identifies kidney as the primum moons. It is not as simple as that. To address this, uh, ADQI consensus conference in 2008, they highlighted the bi-directional nature of interaction in cardiovascular syndrome and they defined CRS as acute or chronic dysfunction of either one of the organ, like heart or kidney, which can induce acute or chronic dysfunction in the other. And they also classified CRS into five types. And today we'll be speaking about type one cardinal syndrome, which is acute in nature and acute dysfunction of the heart causes acute problems in the kidney. For example, cardiogenic shock or uh, coronary syndrome, which can result in acute kidney injury. Pathophysiology. It's important to understand that pathophysiology of CRS involves complex neurohormonal maladaptation. Uh, number one being probably reduced cardiac output, which leads to renal vasoconstriction because of relative intravascular volume deficit and hypoperfusion, which leads to reduction in GFR. There can be activation of renal angiotensin system and ADH potentiation because of this, which leads to salt water retention and volume overload which in turn raises the CVP, causes RV distension and congestion, renal venous congestion, which in turn reduces GFR as well as tubular flow. And RV distension leading to poor LV filling, which we call as reverse burn him phenomenon, can also lead to deranged renal function. Now, how do we diagnose this condition? In general, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to rule out native kidney disease, which can be done by ultrasonography or urine analysis. Uh, we can also use elevated burn creatine ratio because of relative intravascular uh, hypovolemia, burn creatine ratio will be higher. Sodium profiling also can be useful. Non-invasive imaging like echo, which can assess uh, EYE prime ratio to assess degree of congestion and renal ultrasound, um, which portends poor prognosis if there is discontinuous or monomorphic venous flow in the kidney. And certain invasive monitoring, very rarely we, can, we may use PA catheter, but escape trial has clearly shown the role is very limited. And uh, biomarkers, which are the newer frontier in diagnosis and guidance of goal directed therapy in cardinal syndrome. Now, how do we use biomarkers? Because this is a newer thing which has come up these days. Um, so, uh, current definition of acute kidney injury is based on changes in functional kidney biomarkers like serum creatine uh, or urine output. But uh, these can be negative in uh, functional serum creatinine fluctuation, like uh, serum creatinine or urine output may be higher in patients with AKI, but they may not truly reflect acute kidney injury. So biomarkers can help us differentiate true AKI from functional elevation in creatinine. For example, if it is only functional change without loss of function, then biomarkers may be negative in the presence of elevated creatinine or blood urea nitrogen. But if both biomarkers and burn creatinine are higher, then damage could be there along with loss of function. So combination with biomarkers, can lead to better discrimination of AKI and reduce time lag before intervention based on functional markers alone. Like if we base the treatment on burn creatinine alone, it may lead to time delay in initiation of treatment. It may guide goal-directed therapy. For example, aggressive decongestive therapy can lead to elevation in burn creatinine, but it may not lead to elevation in biomarkers. So we know that it is just a functional change, not a real damage to the kidney. Real biomarkers in uh, CRS. So there are two types of biomarkers, glomerular filtration markers and renal tubular markers. I do not want to go into detail, but TIMP2 and IGF-BP7, they are combined to form something called nephrocheck. It is still not, not yet established in CRS, but it is the upcoming uh, uh, modality of prognostication and diagnosis. Now, how do we treat um, CRS type 1? That is the acute setting. Now, we need to uh, understand the rationale of treatment here. There is no therapy which is found to increase glomerular filtration rate in patients with cardinal syndrome, be type 1 or any other uh, CRS. 
So what we need to understand is improvement in cardiac function is something that can improve glomerular filtration rate, which is proven by Intermac Registry and Miracle Trial, where they identified improvement in GFR when they used LVADs to improve the ejection fraction and cardiac output. Reduction, is con reduction in congestion is extremely important because it can lead to subsequent improvement in cardiac function even at the cost of worsening renal function, like aggressive decongestive therapy in the form of diuretic can lead to elevation in burn and creatine, but overall survival still is better with worsening of renal function. So what do diuretics do in CRS? One thing is diuretic use in heart failure and effect on serum creatinine GFR. If we analyze, elevated creatinine can happen during decongestion because of renal hypoperfusion in very, uh, very small subset of population. Whereas many times serum creatinine remains unchanged because heart remains on the flatter portion of the Starling curve. In many cases, there can be reduction in serum creatinine also with diuresis because of reduced renal, uh, renal venous congestion and better LV filling. So uh, uh, best outcomes occur with aggressive fluid removal, even if it is associated with mild to moderate worsening of renal function during decongestive therapy which is proven by escape trial and Everest trials, wherein hemoconcentration associated with worsening renal function was actually associated with better mortality. Goal is to eliminate clinical evidence of congestion. Worsening renal failure is likely to reflect hemodynamic effects of decongestion, but not structural damage or acute kidney injury. There comes the role of biomarkers. Sometimes if the biomarkers are negative, we can still continue aggressive decongestive therapies. Um, now, how can we use diuretics? Oral versus IV. Oral has uh, less predictable bioavailability, so IV is preferred in acute setting. Infusion versus bolus. Infusion can lead to um, higher net fluid loss. However, all other clinical indices like you know safety as well as other uh, mortality indicators, they favor bolus doses. There is no difference in cumulative dose requirement or efficacy or safety endpoints when compared to or, uh, infusion versus bolus. But then, um, if we compare high versus low dose, lower doses are associated with lower in-hospital mortality, length of stay, and renal adverse events. Um, what, what we need to identi identify at the end of all these trials is achieving clinically relevant diuresis while closely monitoring renal function is the most important thing. Now, a slow stepwise escalation of dose is what is recommended based on caris heart failure as well as avoid heart failure trials. So this is just an example chart wherein you quantify the urine output on a daily basis, target around 3 to 5 liter urine output, and escalate your uh, diuretic dose based on basal diuretic dose that the patient is taking. So a stepwise approach results in better ultra uh, better um, you know, decongestion. Now, um, diuretic resistance is an important concept to identify. It is defined as attenuation of maximal diuretic effect over time. So this is associated with worse outcome. So if somebody is having raised creatinine with, di with diuretic use, but keeps getting decongested, then the outcomes are better. If the urine output comes down with escalation of diuretic, it is indicative of diuretic resistance and it is associated with worse outcome. Many factors are there. Uh, remedy could be frequent small dosing or combination therapies, especially stepwise increase in the diuretic dose. Diuretic efficiency is another concept. Net fluid output or weight change after a fixed dose is what assesses the diuretic efficiency. It is also a prognostic marker and it can help us identify those subset of patients who have worse outcomes. Now, when do we do ultrafiltration? When we consider ultrafiltration over and above diuresis. In patients with diuretic resistance or impaired renal function, wherein they do not respond to diuretic, they uh, ultrafiltration tends to maintain physiologic electrolyte balance by removing isotonic fluid. This is in comparison to um, diuresis, wherein the fluid removed, removed is actually hypotonic. Many studies have been done. Initial studies like rapid and unload, they showed that uh, ultrafiltration removes more fluid, whereas renal function is better preserved with those. But subsequent trials like CARES, CURE, or avoid heart failure, um, the fluid removed or the decongestion was similar in both the groups, diuretic group as well as uh, ultrafiltration group. But side effect was higher in, uh, ultra, in ultrafiltration group. Um, so, neurohormonal modulation, this is another area where the treatment is focused. Um, Everest program, tactic and secret, many trials, they assessed tolvapton, which led to greater weight loss, but mortality benefit was uh, not there. As many other trials like Ascend Heart Failure, Rose Heart Failure, they tried Neseritide, again, no statistically significant improvement in dyspnea, hospitalization or death. 
so probably not indicated now inotropic therapy is another area it can help crs by improving cardiac output and reducing venous congestion flip side arrhythmias ischemias and worsening long term myocardial function low dose dopamine has been tried dad heart failure trial trial um, identified some improvement uh, but then rose heart failure trial with a lower dose provided no benefit so probably this uh, benefit identified in dad heart uh, dad heart failure trial is because of improved inotropy and cardiac output other therapies uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone antagonism nephrolysin nirlocorticoid antagonists all these are tried in other forms of crs uh, cardiac device therapy um, icd resynchronization therapy mechanical circulatory support all these have been tried now coming coming to the prognosis reduced baseline gfr is associated with higher mortality in crs change in gfr either increase or decrease during therapy for heart failure indicates poor cardiac reserve so uh, this is also associated with um, increased mortality any change either increase or decrease diuretics and ace inhibitors they can cause transient increase in serum creatinine but they only reflect temporary change in renal filtration not a real acute kidney injury so the medicines need to be continued elevated blood urea and nitrogen again is a poor prognostic factor microalbuminuria so all these are indicative of poorer prognosis in crs type 1 now what do we conclude at the end of this session number 1 crs is a complex syndrome reflecting cardio renal cross talk uh, so both the organs are involved and uh, it's a complex pathophysiology most important being renal congestion diuretics are the mainstay of therapy in crs type 1 escalated step wise based on urine output goals so that is very important neither bolus nor infusion it has to be escalated step wise transient increase in serum creatinine during treatment does not indicate acute kidney injury continue the treatment as decongestion improves mortality ultrafiltration has to be done in refractory cases inotropes for low cardiac output most importantly improved cardiac function leads to improved survival with that note i will uh, hand over the podium to dr ajit he will tell you how to uh, you know uh, what is the role of uh, um, uh, uh, circulatory devices and other things thank you So good evening. The topic is mechanical assist devices and indication for heart transplant. So we have ten minutes is left. So I will be just browsing through some of the some major aspects and uh, I will try to conclude the topic. So basically, we'll be talking about the mechanical assist devices. And uh, when we talk about the mechanical assist device, we talk about the short term devices, and we need to have a mention about the intermediate and the long term devices. and finally into the second aspect of the topic the indication for heart transplant so basically short time mechanical devices are you know usually used for a prophylactic insertion insertion of high risk invasive coronary artery procedures the management of cardiogenic shock acute decompensatory cardiac heart failure and cardiopulmonary assist arrest provide circulatory support by performing work for a failing left or right front right ventricles or or both and basically when we come to the short term devices you know i just want to mention there are four types are there the most commonly used short term devices that i would like to say that undoubtedly it is intraoperative the balloon pump iabp and there are certain in the non iabp percutaneous mechanic mechanical circulatory devices i would like to have a mention about that about you know uh, about impel and tandem heart i'll just come to that tandem device in extra corporeal membrane oxygenation we know that it is getting more and more popular and obviously finally the non percutaneous centrifugal pumps which are used for cardiopulmonary bypass so what i mean to say is that there are four types is there the most commonly used one is the intraoperative balloon pump then obviously the non iap percutaneous devices like impella and you know the tandem heart and in you know, ecmo and you know the non percutaneous device which i already mentioned so basically i don't want to read everything but there's a short term mechanical devices you know they improve the intraocular perfusion reduction in the intracardiac filling pressures because anybody can Read the you know from the literature you know it's just freely available reduction in the left ventricular volumes wall stress 
and the myocard decrease the myocard in myocardial oxygen consumption and the augmentation of the, the most important thing the augmentation of the coronary perfusion and you know this results in you know obviously prevention and em em amelioration of the cardiogenic shock because you know some of the things are very controversial reduction in the pulmonary congestion reduction in the manifestation of myocardial ischemia and reduction in the final reduction of the infarct size so indication of the short end devices because again you know it's a big list is there so it is believed that you know some controls still they still there still it is believed that very high risk per coronary coronary interventions including those with complex coronary artery uh, disease involving the large tertiary and severe lv dysfunction ejection fraction less than 35% these kind of people whenever you do a procedure there is high risk is that though i'm just coming to that so these it is believed that these you know these devices might be helpful acute myocardial infarction complicated by acute ischemic my mr mitral regurgitation or in a ventricular septal rupture and rupture and cardiogenic what i mean is that these are the mechanical complications like you develop a acute mr or vsd or even a anterior wall rupture and patient is in shock this is one of the better indications and advance right to left side of heart failure during the period of stabilization of a critically ill patient while making a decisions about long term support bridge to bridge because you are just supporting for some time and support during high risk percutaneous valve procedures and the support for patients you know especially for the patients you are undergoing the electrophysiology procedure some of them will have a poor lv dysfunction ventricular dysfunction and you know they may not if they develop some kind of vt vt cell they may not be able to sustain the procedure and patients with medically refractory arrhythmias so the ischemia and acute cardiac allograft failure post transplant right ventricular failure so so these are the condition because i'm sorry for the long list because anybody can read that because i don't i don't have the time to go through that and the contraindication anything you know because the, all these devices definitely will be in the iota so my sense will be talking about the contraindication that anything which is you know significant issues the iota like aortic regurgitation mechanical aortic valve aortic aneurysm dissection severe aortic or peripheral artery disease naturally you know these will be these devices will be contraindication and left ventricular left atrial thrombus by bleeding diastasis uncontrolled sepsis we know that you know most of the any of these devices will be contraindicated and then i am talking about the iabb this is my favorite thing because this intraiotic balloon pump i want to tell you that this is the most commonly used you know the mechanical assist device the you know off late in iabb has become very controversial as well previously you know every cardiologist used to do you know people used to do you know i mean even in at this point of time they used to do the iabb you know in each and every patient who is undergoing you know any sort of coronary intervention but there is a lot of controversy which is happening there so the currently you know some kind of a consensus you know medium sort of you know consensus will be that when you have an hypotension like you know or less than 90 there is a approximately, approximately that it comes at the for the definition of cardiogenic shock when the systolic bp is less than 90 or there is a less than 30 mm fall from the mean arterial pressure of cardiac origin you know this this can be used and you know another indication is you know the cardiogenic shock that is not quickly revised by pharmacologic therapy what i mean to say is that every shock you know it is not that you just put an iabb you need to try with the pharmacologic agents then only you can do that you know then only you can try that and most importantly i want to tell you that iabp the very clear undisputable indicator for iabp you know, even at this point of time is that there is the mechanical complication of the acute myocardial infarction and the patient is developing a mi acute mr particularly with a papillary muscle rupture with a ventricular septal rupture maybe you know you know what do you call the angio or perforation where this is the, this is the most important that the patient has to go for the immediate you know cabg so naturally this patient will be put on iabb they'll be going go for a cabg then in the surgeons will try to you know obviously the the mortality is going to be high but still they will be trying to correct these you know mechanical complications so what i mean to say in this slide is that the most important undisputable indication at this point of time is that when you have an acute myocardial infarction is that is that the patient is having a mechanical complication by you know by the papillary muscle you know mr like mr vsd etc and obviously is the iab iabb you know the waveforms because every student is supposed to know something because you know when i was a student you know i used to be very thorough just before 24 hours 40 hours before the exams underline unless and until i use it very frequently you know sometimes you know some kind of a you know uh, you know the confusion comes so obviously you have the waveforms on here you have you know, the systolic thing this is the augmented diastolic you can see the second waveform this is the this is the diastolic notes the you know see that the augmentation what is happening is has to be you know it has to be in a smooth transition to the augment augmented diastole augmentation has to be there and you can see the 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 pre augmented you know the unassisted uh, the diastolic pressure the pre this is the augmentation which is happening here the pre augmented you know the systolic pressure you can see see here this is the, the pre augmented this augmentation which is happening the pre augmented diastolic pressure here the what i mean is that after augmentation the systolic pressure the systolic pressure 
and the diastolic pressure has to be low than the pre augmentation systolic diastolic pressure what i mean to say is that you see the systolic pressure here this is a pre augmentation this is definitely more than the, the post augmentation diastolic pressure you can see definitely it is more and even the end diastolic pressure pre augmentation is more than the end diastolic di, you know end diastolic post augmentation pressure what i mean to say that again is that from the students point of view is that the post augmentation values of the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure is less than the pre augmentation values because this if you know that i will be i am very sure you will be able to identify where the problem is i'll just browse through some of the thing here you can see that you no know, there is a you, you are supposed to see a very good dichroic notch here you can see that here you know the dichroic notch is not there obviously we can guess that there is there is a early early inflation what is in early inflation what is happening here the early inflation is not good at all you know you can see that and it can reduce the it can increase after load it can increase the you know the end diastolic and left ventricular pressure end end diastolic left ventricular volume diastolic end diastolic left ventricular left ventricular end diastolic volume so so you can see there is a early early inflation which is happening here this a this a late <laughs> inflation you can see that dichroic notch is here and you can see that you know this is you know again you know the it is not smooth transition not happy there is a late inflation which is happening again the issue with the late inflation will be that it will be decreasing the coronary perfusion pressure that's what i want to highlight that and then anybody can go through the see uh, literature and see this again this is about you know the early in early early deflation when you have an early deflation what the main important thing is that i told you the before this the augmented diastolic pressure the pre augmented systolic pressure has to be uh, th this has to be less than the pre augmented systolic uh, you know the post augmented systolic pressure has to be less than the pre augmented systolic pressure you can see that the post augmented systolic pressure is more so this is very characteristic when you can see that this is the very characteristic of early early uh, early deflation so what is going to happen you can have a retrograde flow into the aorta and retrograde flow into the carotid arteries in this kind of situation and this is a very classic example of a late deflation what you can see that the end diastolic pressure the the i told you, post augmented the end diastolic pressure has to be less than the pre diastolic you know end diastolic uh, pre diastolic uh, end diastolic pressure pre pre augmentation you can see that this is more so you can see that because with this character you can you will be able to identify the issues and when you have the late deflation like this what is going to happen is that the end the the afterload is going to be significantly more so that is what it is so this is you know again from the students point of view when i was in you know doing my residency when i was in uh, working in australia we used to have we used to put a little bit more frequently so basically you need to see where the tip of the balloon is there in any any kind of iabb so there are lots of theory theory is that theoretically what i mean to say is that the tip of the balloon has to be ideally has to be distal to the it should be below the left is origin of the left subclavian artery and above the renal artery the renal artery the re left re the renal artery the renal artery will be above the level of l1 and l2 and it has to be below the the left subclavian artery origin of the left subclavian artery so if it is going above that left subclavian you can obviously you can occlude us even you know the the circulation cerebral circulation you know even the hand circulation the upper knee circulation can be occluded with that and if it is you know if it is below the renal artery again it can have some issues with that so basically it has to be below that one you know rule of the thumb is that what i used to follow was that i used to see, uh, ensure that the tip of the balloon is you know, just above the upper border of the left main bronchus if it is visible the, that means just above the thing and sometimes you know some people believe that even you know if you see that tip of the balloon at the level of the carina that will be more than okay and uh, the, these are the things see one is that many people believe that the tip of the balloon can be the level of the carina the carina number one or or you know it may be just above the upper border of the left main bronchus that will be sufficient and as i told you it has to be just below the left left below the left subclavian artery and it's it has to be above the in between the this subclavian artery and you know the renal artery which i between l1 l1 and l2 which i already mentioned to you so here be complications we know limber renal ischemia vascular assassinations major hemorrhage sepsis studies have shown that the sepsis is going to be more when the when the iabb is more than 7 days you know that is one thing which i just could do that but obviously it just varies depend on the care and all but usually it is believed that with more than 7 days the sepsis is going to be more but obviously we all know as in intensives we know that we need to remove the iabp at the earliest possible cholesterol embolization is a rare thing obviously it can still happen because unfortunately if it is embolizing it can occlude the major vessels cerebral vascular assassin can be there obviously you know when the thrombus is going you know the, the retrograde direction balloon rupture is a is a theoretical i mean it's a the possibility is there nowadays the modern machines you know they can you know even suck up the whole thing you know once the rupture happens and you know before i saw that the iabb the most you know uh, the most commonly used to the the the, the device the ester device there are there are two or three trial which i want to mention to you one is the bcis one trial which is in you know, iabb is used in 
electively in high risk patients with you know who are undergoing the coronary angio angio coronary interventional coronary procedures in this trial they found that even if you use the iabb in electively in high risk patient there was no difference in the clinical benefit at all second trial was something called crisp ami trial at least i can mention the names i presume this trial also this the ia the acute myocardial infarction we thought shock in the iabb was used there also there was no clinical benefit and the most important trial which has spoken where you know iabb is come highly disputable is the iabb shock 2 trial which i want to tell you many many times is a very very you know landmark trial where around 600 patients with cardiogenic shock where, you know who are undergoing early vascularization revascularization was you know put on iabb they could not find any difference in you know any clinical benefit in mortality or icu length of stay we just studied it in you know, 30 days even one year in even 6.2 years what i mean to say is that this iab shock 2 trial has made i you know iabp bit controversial of you know iabp the routine use of an iabp in cardiogenic shock which i want to tell you from the students point of view and obviously you know apart from the iabp we have another device a peculiar device are the list is too big i don't want to read out everything you know rvad you know different things are there i want to mention about you know the uh, show you about you know the impella i told you the impella is basically you know you have you know Uh, what what's happening in bell is uh, through the left to left the femoral artery you are putting a catheter through the aortic valve and you know there is a pump is put into that and you know it is making a flow of you know 2.5 liters through the arteria through the through the femoral artery it is going the, through the aortic valve the retrograde direction the pump is put inside and you know this is you know made to you know the you know the, there is a pump itself which is going to uh, you know propagate the blood in at around 2.5 liter that is impeller device we have the tandem heart what is happening here is that there is internal catheter which is going to the which is going through the veins and it when it's in the right atrium there is a trans a trans inter interceptor puncture is made the catheter is entered the left atrium so what i mean to say that through the vein it is going to the right heart through the through the inter atrial septum it is going to puncture the left left atrium there is internal catheter the outgoing catheter is from the femoral artery and you know this in a pump is in a pumping at a rate of uh, i can't remember exciting maybe around 4 liter per minute and there is a, there is a photo of femoro femoro septal i will say the left atrio femoral femoral artery you know kind of a device you know that is there which has been you know again again another supported device it is percutaneous company the no percutaneous devices because then i i just want to tell you one or two names there biomedical and sans probably you know people can you know google and see that because you know i don't have any experience with that this is the non percutaneous device which i want to tell you and about the intermediate long term devices we have you know again i have got cut short i don't want to prolong the talk i just cut short the thing we have first generation first generation devices we can we can be read in the terms of heart beat one the thoracic and novacord i don't have time to describe that and the second generation one is a heart beat two jervic 2000 and berlin incor second generation devices we have third generation devices are there you know for you know heart hardware heart beat three and total artificial heart you know these are the third generation devices so coming to the the second part of the part of my topic i just want to talk about you know the heart transplantation so basically indications are there this is as per the american heart association and in the american college uh, american cardio cardiology college of cardiology indications so refractory cardiogenic shock requiring intraoperative in balloon pump counter, counter pulsation or left ventricular glasses or or left ventricular glasses device cardiogenic shock requiring continuous intravenous inotropy that be dobutamine mildutone etc the peak vo2 that is very important the maximum oxygen consumption that is you know it is determined by the cardiopulmonary exercise testing less than 10 cc per kilogram of air per minute i would like to say this is a very important parameters i just want to tell you that i'm just coming to that so this is very important and new york heart association class of 3 or 4 despite maximized medical and recognized therapy resynchronized therapy so what i mean to say that nih if you are not maximized in the resynchronized therapy you cannot in you know, every every tom and dick and hardy will be asking for you know heart transplant so naturally we need to have a criteria so recurrent recurrent life threatening left ventricular arrhythmia despite implantable cardiac defibrillator and arrhythmic therapy or catheter place ablation end stage congenital heart failure with no evidence of pulmonary hypertension refractory angina without potential medical or surgical option i am sorry for the long list when i went to the literature it was significantly long around five times more than this and i just you know concluded with this so this is the heart it's a general indication what i mean to tell you having said that this is the american heart association american college of cardiology indication there was a more specific guideline from the european society of cardiology where you know they have mentioned that rather than telling that you know very this are there more specific guide, uh, indicators are there you can just go through that severe symptoms of heart failure with dyspnea or fatigue at rest or on minimal exertion new york heart house is a functional class 3 or 4 episodes of fluid retention pulmonary or systemic congestion of peripheral edema and to reduce cardiac output at rest objective evidence of severe cardiac dysfunction i find it very interesting shown by at least one of the following things 
left ventricular ejection fraction less than 30%, pseudo, pseudo normal restrictive mitral inflow pattern on Doppler echocardiography, high left ventricular feeling pressures, mean pulmonary artery wedge pressure more than 16, or mean right tail pressure more than 16, high nativity peptide levels in the absence of non cardiac causes, severe impairment of the functional capacity shown by one of the following things. The inability to exercise, six minute walk test, 300, 300 meters or less in females and patient age more than, or in patient more, age more than 75 years. Peak oxygen consumption less than 2 and, you know, most of the guidelines are telling that it has to be less than 10 most of the time. The history of one heart failure hospitalized in the past six months. Presence of all the previous features despite attempt to optimize therapy, including diuretics, renin angiotensin, aldosterone system inhibitors and beta blockers. Unless these are poorly tolerated, contraindicated in the cardiac resynchronization when indicated. So if this thing, this is the, there is, you know, I just want to just want to introduce for the students' point of view one important thing called heart failure survival score. So this is based on you know around on seven parameters: the presence or absence of you know coronary artery disease, resting heart rate, left ventricular ejection fraction, mean arterial pressure, presence or absence of an intraventricular conduction delay on ECG, serum, sodium, and VO2 max. What I mean to say is that this is a very, very important index. This not only determines the cardiac reserves, this, 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 you know, this also determines the dynamic aspect of the cardiac function. What I mean to say is that whichever the peripheral adaptive response can be there in a cardiac failure, which will be assessed by this. And here also the VO2 max is very, very important because when the VO2 max or the peak oxygen consumption is less than 10, it's a definite indication in consideration should be done for a cardiac evaluation. What I want to tell you for the students is that the heart failure survey score, everybody needs to remember, the literature says that when it's less than 2, less, less than 7.2, the mortality is going to be around, you know, the, uh, the, the, the survival is only around 30, 35 to 40%, because one year survival is around 35 to 40%. This can predict the sur survival without, 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 it will predict the survival without heart transplant. When, the, when it's severe, the survival is going to be around 35 to 40%. One year survival is 35 to 40% without cardiac transplant. So this scoring is very important. Another thing which I want to tell you is about, you know, some something about the CTL, you know, heart failure, heart failure uh, model, which you can just Google and see CTL heart failure model. So I don't have anything to conclude. I just want to tell you that, you know, the the intra to balloon pump is the commonest, you know, uh, commonest, commonest, you know, the assist device, circulatory assist device has been used all over the world. The con the routine use of, you know, uh, intra to balloon pump in a myocardial infarction has become very controversial. At the moment, the strong indication, whatever reasonably, you know, agreeable indication will be there for the, you know, definite indication will be for, you know, uh, for the mechanical complication of the heart when, when the patient is developing an acute MR or VSD and the patient is going for a CAB, immediate CABG where you can assist the patient even before and during the procedures, you know, you can go for a, uh, you, can, you can go for a IABP and, you know, uh, you know, other other use of other mechanical acid, acid devices are at this point in time, it has the clinical efficacy is definitely to be proven and, you know, in the in the cardiac thing, the indicator for cardiac transplant. I want to be you know all the students should be aware that you know people should be aware of the peak you know oxygen consumption, which is a very very important aspect of the dynamic function of the heart. It is not only the cardiac reserve, but over the but over the, the peripheral adaptive response the heart can make for the individual patient. And I want to do about you know the the heart failure you know score, risk score that people should be aware. And thank you very much for your patient listening, and thank you. So, so I would like to thank all the all the students, all the participants of this uh, program for an actively attending in this. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you know. Uh, uh, so yeah, I would like to thank the Asia Asia College of Medical Education for you know, organizing this you know this webinar at this point of time. And obviously, on behalf of ISCCM, I would like to again you know once again thank all of you for actively participating in this. And you know, obviously, I would thank my you know hospital, Dr. Manipal Hospital, for giving us an opportunity to the space and time for you know providing this you know service to all of us. And all the speakers, all my friends and colleagues in my department who has been you know instrumental in making this program a good you know success. Thank you all once again. Have a great day. Yeah. So probably what I what I understand from you know what the plan the current plan is that you'll be able to get a link of the discussion in the YouTube.
All right, Vinay? Vinay? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Are we gonna um, cut at this point? Yeah, we are okay to disconnect, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very much for the help. Yeah. Thank you.